Adventure Bike Shop, proud sponsors of Adventure Bike TV. Rubbish adverts. Greater adventure. Hello and welcome to Adventure Bike TV. Now, some of you may have seen that we are running a Patreon campaign. Tom was talking about it on one of his filming segments. We would like to say a huge thank you to every single one of you for your ongoing support by becoming a patron of the show. If you're interested in becoming a patron, you can find out all about it at patreon.com forward slash Adventure Bike TV. And now on with the show. And as always, we're going to be starting with the bike review. All Metal Mule panniers are designed and manufactured in the UK. Metal Mule. Engineered to be different. Proud sponsors of the bike reviews on Adventure Bike TV. Right, on this month's bike review, we're sticking with a similar theme to the SWM from last month. We're going for a middle-sized engine bike with a kind of middle-sized price, but there's a second reason for it. This month's bike review is on a bike that has a very, very close relationship with the KTM 690 Enduro R, which is a bike being used by many round the world adventurers. This month's bike review is the Husqvarna 701 Enduro. Right, before we get into any of the detail in terms of the review of this bike, let's just talk about the name. Now I call it Husqvarna. Now I'm told it sounds like I'm saying an A between the Q and the V, and you should say it Husqvarna which sounds exactly like I said it a minute ago, but anyway, Husqvarna, Husqvarna, we got it. Now, there's a bit of a checkered history with this brand. So they used to be their own brand. Then for a very short period of time, they were owned by BMW, then owned by KTM. Now KTM have brought together Husqvarna and Husaberg. So what we have here is a Husqvarna bike based on a KTM bike with Husaberg colors. Are you still with me? Right. The other question is, how does this brand sit within the KTM family? Now we all know KTM is ready to race. And the Husqvarna apparently is not so much ready to race, more ready to ride really fast on the roads. Let's see. Back in 2015, the 701 Enduro and its supermoto bad boy brother were Husqvarna's first offering since KTM's management took over. In some ways, it's a bit like looking at the Toyota GT86. You start with a great vehicle, change the badge, make a few tweaks, and behold the Subaru BRZ. The 701 Enduro is basically a KTM 690 Enduro R, but with three very clear differences, namely to its engine maps, to its suspension, and to the bodywork. Back in 2015, the 701 Enduro and its supermoto bad boy brother were Husqvarna's first offering since KTM's management took over. In some ways, it's a bit like looking at the Toyota GT86. You start with a great vehicle, change the badge, make a few tweaks and behold the Subaru BRZ. The 701 Enduro is basically a KTM 690 Enduro R but with three very clear differences namely to its engine maps, to its suspension and to the bodywork. Husqvarna say that by softening the suspension and making the throttle more predictable, they have made it more accessible, comfortable and enjoyable for the everyday rider. And you know what? They've largely succeeded. The slipper clutch is a joy, helping to make it well-mannered and a really easy bike to ride as long as you treat the throttle with respect but that doesn't stop it wanting to pull wheelies in first, second and third if you don't. All I need to learn now is how to wheelie properly and then I'll be able to demonstrate. But 
that's for another day. bike for, I don't know, just over an hour now. I just wanted to stop and give a really, really quick first impression. One word springs to mind. Hooligan. It's a hooligan's bike. And that reminds me of the 690. Because basically it's pretty much the same bike. It's the same chassis, it's the same engine, but they have tuned it slightly differently. So it is a smoother ride, but it is a total hooligan's bike. It is really quick, 70 horsepower, 145 kilos dry. Uh, it just reminds me of everything I loved about riding the 690. You do feel like a 17 year old on your first, well, I used to think of the DT175 when I was a kid. It just makes you feel like a hooligan. However, it is quite a tall bike. Not a problem for me, because I'm quite tall. But I'd like to demonstrate. Let me just bring in my able assistant, Mr. Thomas Woodrow. Tom. Please demonstrate where, if you haven't got the length of the leg that I have, how easy this bike is to get on and off of. You ready for this? Top. This is, uh, this is going to be incredibly great graceful. <laughs> I can't. I'm not going to be able to take the side sander. I can't. Look at my leg. My leg doesn't even reach the peg on that side. That's it. If I put my weight on it, I can get the peg, but then to put the foot down on this side, I'm going to need to do a shuffle. <laughs> yeah, I'll leave this one to you. <laughs> so there you go. A bike for tall people. <laughs> So specifically, what has changed? Well, suspension. The 701 gets WP all round with 275mm travel over the 690's 250mm and the forks are lighter than a conventional upside down fork. The closed cartridge 4CS forks were specifically designed for Husqvarna by WP but as hugely interesting as it is, it's how they look that really stands out. The sight of those forks hits you right square between the eyes, like a set of Greek pillars holding up the Parthenon. They just look so solid, and they're easy to work with. Adjustment is really simple even with gloves on. I ran the compression right up tight to see how much it improved the road manners and it did make a real difference. Turn in was a little sharper and there was much less wallow, pretty much as you'd expect. Of course, I'd never advise taking your hands off the bars to adjust the forks whilst riding, but I am reliably informed that it's easy peasy. Also much as you'd expect, the Enduro doesn't have the whacking great 4-pot brakes of the Supermoto, but the Brembo Twin Pots are more than capable. Even with those long pillars of forks, there was minimal squirming under hard braking, and I never felt like it was getting out of hand. The brakes are assisted by the latest Bosch 9.1 MP ABS, which can be disabled completely via a button on the dash. The smoother fuel map makes a 701 less snatchy than the 690, but then I never found the throttle maps on the 690 to be a problem in the first place. I'm sure, to the professional palette, the difference in the mapping would be more obvious, but not so much to little old me. Oh, and there's an extra litre of fuel, taking the tank up to 13 litres. Lastly, the bodywork. Now Husqvarna tells us that it has been altered from the 690 for comfort with rubber mounted handlebars and a more comfortable seat. Well, the seat doesn't feel any different to me at all. But the bodywork is interesting. Husqvarna have obviously gone out of their way to make it visually quite different from the 690. Obviously the colours are different. 
but there is a big difference in the rear bodywork. The 701 has a much deeper and overall much larger rear section, or to give it its proper name, the single piece polyamide rear subframe and tank. All part of making it look a little less ready to race and more ready to go for a great grinning ride. Our jury of two was out. I like the bodywork, Tom a bit less so. Okay, so what did I think of the Husqvarna 701? Well, there's not many words that describe it really, apart from two, grin factor. And that's how I described the KTM 690 Enduro R 18 months ago or so. And it's just the same, although maybe a little softer and a little easier to ride, a bit more road oriented, but it is huge fun. It is quick, it handles well. And although I didn't do a lot off-road, I can imagine it would be absolutely fabulous, just like the 690 was. But I think the better comparison is probably to think about it next to the SWM that we looked at last month. I mean, there's not dissimilar prices, engine size is very similar, weight, kind of similar. Now, if you went with your head looking for an adventure bike, every time I think you go for the SWM, it's a bit more practical, you get the hard luggage with it, it's not quite so mad. But if you went with your heart, just like I do, every single time, Rucksack, bit of soft luggage, Husqvarna 701 every single time. Tie down loops to allow extra luggage space are set at a height to ensure the lock is protected from damage. Metal Mule, engineered to be different. Proud sponsors of the bike reviews on Adventure Bike TV. Okay, now. When I ride bikes on our bike review, I always love them. I don't care how big or small or whatever kind of bike it is, but there's some that just leave you with the biggest smile on your face. And that bike was one of them. Now it's time for Tom's film school, and he's gonna be talking about the rule of thirds. Hello and welcome to this month's Film School. So this month we're going to be looking at composition. This is going to be incredibly basic. We just want to make sure that people out there know how to do a half decent composed shot. And one of the first things you need to make a good shot is to learn the rule of thirds. So what is the rule of thirds? Well actually it's a simplified version of the golden ratio. Now the golden ratio is basically what mathematics says makes things beautiful. The golden ratio is actually found throughout nature. Uh, flowers, plants, seashells, things like that all follow this mathematical formula to make something look beautiful. So we may talk about the golden ratio another time, but we're gonna look at the rule of thirds, which as I said, is a simplified version. So the idea is that you divide up your screen with two horizontal lines and two vertical lines. Once you've done this, you'll end up with nine equally sized boxes. Now, what you need to do is get anything that's your point of interest, a person or a bike or anything like that, should be sitting on one of those vertical lines. Even better, have it sitting on where one of the vertical lines and the horizontal lines cross. If you do this, you should end up with a more balanced and more pleasing image. So I brought my kids in with me today uh, and I'm going to be filming them just to give you an idea of how to use that rule of thirds in composition. So the first thing you need to be asking yourself is what is the most important thing in my image and what is the most important point on that important thing. So for example, if a face is the most important thing, on that face the eyes would be the most important part of that. So when we look at an image like this, it doesn't seem quite right there's something not working on that image. 
Now, if we were to move this image so that it ends up in line with the vertical lines and eyes close as we can to that intersection point, it becomes a much more pleasing and interesting image. Now, this is also the same when you look at a landscape picture. This time you want to be lining up your horizon, preferably with the bottom horizontal line. However, it works quite well if it's lined up with the top horizontal line. The key is you want to be able to use one of those two lines as your horizon. And again, it's all about creating a nice, interesting, balanced image. So if you have two subjects in the picture, then try and get one on each of the vertical lines. If they're standing close together, you can actually get them both onto one vertical line. Again, creating a nice, pleasing image. So what about centrally framing your subject? Why would you do this? Well, the first one is when someone is talking to camera, directly to the audience. I'm doing it now, but I've made the choice that I would rather be on one of the third lines, but sometimes it works very well for that person to be dead center. And it creates an interesting kind of dynamic um, when you're talking to audiences. So the other times you'll use central framing are specifically when you want to show off fantastic symmetry in your shot. Have a look here, my kids walking down a hallway. It's a nice symmetrical shot and it works quite well. This works brilliantly when you're trying to do things like motorcycles coming towards you and you can stand in the center of the road and you've got that long road going off to a vanishing point in the distance. It can look absolutely amazing and incredibly stunning footage. But don't forget to still use those vertical and horizontal lines to guide yourself to make sure you've got some really nice symmetry in your frame. So the next thing to bear in mind when you're composing your shots is to make sure you have leading room. Now this is where you make sure that when someone is looking, they're not looking off screen, they're looking across the screen. So here's an example. My boy is looking off the screen, but he's quite clearly looking off in the wrong direction. We've left space on the other side for him to look into and he's not using it. Change that shot so that he's actually looking into that space and it's much more pleasing. And you'll tend to notice this is how we do the majority of our under the visor interviews as well. It works really, really well for interviews. So make sure you're giving that people that looking space. Of course, what happens if someone changes from looking left to right? This is where you need to get a bit of camera motion in there. Make sure you follow them across so that looking room is always there in front of them. And it's not just from looking side to side. Bear in mind if someone looks up or down, you need to accommodate for that in your camera work as well. So this also applies when you are filming moving objects. You want them to have space to move into. You don't want them at the edge of frame going out of frame. Now this is difficult. Not only does it mean you have to really get the camera work right, if you're doing a documentary style film, which most of the people who are watching this probably will be because it's for their adventure motorcycle trips, you can get the shot wrong sometimes. And if you do, you just have to make that decision. Is it still worth it, worthy of being in your film? Or is that something you wanna leave out? In fact, all of these are suggested rules. They're not laws, you can break them if you want to. But to be honest, you need to understand them and understand how they work before you try and break them. Because otherwise it just won't work. The next thing to consider is headroom. Headroom's really important. You don't want someone's head being cut off at the top. It's really important that their full head shape is there. It looks a lot more natural and it doesn't jar the viewer when they're watching your film. However, when you start to get very, very close up, the real important thing is not to cut off someone's chin. Cutting off someone's chin just looks weird, especially if they're talking. There is something very strange about someone talking and you not being able to see their chin moving up and down properly. So when you're that close up, an extreme close up on someone's face, you can cut the top of the head off, but do not cut their chin off. Okay, so the last kind of important thing that I wanted to kind of cover in this kind of basics of composition is balancing your shot. This will help your viewers feel at ease with what they're watching and they feel a lot more comfortable and it's not jarring or off-putting in any way. Balancing happens in lots of scenes. For instance, now, I'm standing to the slight right of the screen and to balance that out, we have this to the left 
uh, and that creates a, a nice kind of balanced shot. Now it doesn't always have to be balanced with uh, objects, it can be balanced with light. So for example, you could have it balanced with a kind of shadow on one side, as we see here. All we can do is we can, if there's too much shadow and it feels very dark, we can add a bit of kind of lens flare or just a bit of light into that shot to make it more interesting and more balanced. Okay, so those are my basics of frame compositions. I hope they're helpful to you guys and girls out there who are making these kind of travel documentaries. Uh, please send them in, we'd love to see them, they'd be fantastic. Um, now just to answer a few questions that have come in from people. So this month we actually haven't had that many questions in. Uh, I actually had two questions on this stuff behind me uh, asking, can they send stuff uh, for our wall? Yes, of course you can. If you've got any cool stuff you want to send for our wall, you're perfectly welcome to. We're not going to put up great big like posters of people who aren't advertisers on the show or anything like that. But, you know, if you've got anything cool you want to go up there, just yeah, send it to us. It'd be cool. And the other thing was a lot of people have noticed that we put a load of videos up on YouTube this month. We're just trying to build the website a bit better so it has these kind of watch segments. So if you only want to watch bike reviews uh, or you only want to watch the film school episodes or you want to find a specific bike review, uh, it, it should all become a lot easier. So although it means a lot more content on YouTube, there will be still the playlists on YouTube. The show will still be going live on the first of every single month. Uh, and it will be the only thing up there for at least a week. We'll leave that alone for a week before we start uploading anything else. Uh, but it also means if you want to go over to our website, then of course you'll be able to see more there and it should be a lot more kind of easy to see and, and work with. So we hope you enjoy that. Okay, so that's it. Thank you to everyone for watching. Thank you to everyone that uh, has gone onto Patreon and helped us out that way. That's been absolutely fantastic. Can't thank you guys and girls enough. Uh, if anyone else would like to do it, they can go there. If not, fine, just carry on watching the show. And uh, please share, tell everyone about the show, and I'll give you back to Graham. Thanks as always, Tom. Beautifully informative, what can I say? Now it's time for a slightly new spin on the Travel Journal where we're gonna join Antonia Bolingbroke Kent where we go behind the scenes of her new book. It's eight o'clock in the morning. I'm in the middle of Nambafa National Park, which is dense, dense jungle. God knows what's lurking and prowling and purring and slithering in, the, in that dark green mass. I decided this trip that I would do the sort of vulnerable travel thing. I would just trust in humanity and the universe that it was gonna be okay. just watched six mittens being sacrificed. I'm a vegetarian. Can't really deal with animal sacrifice first thing in the morning. Happy Holy! What do you reckon? Yeah, that's you. That's you, there. 
we are nearly at the site of where an American C-46 crashed in February 1945. Down here, there's, there's bits of parachute, so obviously the men didn't have time to, to get out. And seventy five meters. <laughs> These things are good for you, right? These things that really test you. That's why we do adventures. That's why we plunge into the unknown. We take the risks because every time you overcome something like this, you overcome your fears, you face your fears, and you overcome them, then you realize you're a little bit stronger than you thought you were. So what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? Okay. Thank you, Antonia. It's now time to pay some bills. So we'll see you after the advert break. The Adventure Bike Shop, proud sponsors of Adventure Bike TV. Rubbish adverts. Greater adventure. Adventure Bike Shop, proud sponsors of Adventure Bike TV. Rubbish adverts. Greater adventure. Okay, welcome back. And I'm not going to say anything about the next segment other than you should really watch it. Every time we go to MMP to borrow a bike for the bike review, there's something we see there that kind of takes our fancy, but we always say on Adventure Bike TV that any bike can be an adventure bike, but this probably stretches it. Yeah, a little bit. And because we have an assistant with us today, um, we can have me on camera too. Yes. <laughs> but look at it! It is cool, isn't it's it? It's so cool! It is, yeah. It's a thing, it is a thing of beauty. This one is. This one is a thing of beauty. There are other ones that aren't quite as pleasant Not so looking. Much. Not so much. But this is gorgeous. Yeah. It's kind of like the weird love child of a Caterham 7 and a go-kart <laughs> with a threesome motorbike thing going on. And, and a snowmobile. <laughs> and a snowmobile thrown in, yeah. Like, snowmobiles back in the genealogy summer, like grandfather. Um, when I first rode it, I, I kind of didn't know what to expect. I thought it was going to be really boring. It is anything but boring. It's, it's 
mental in its own way. It is, it's nothing like riding a motorbike. It's nothing at all. No, not at all. Fair. And I've never ridden a, a proper skidoo. I imagine this is what yeah. it's like. It feels a bit like, weirdly, a bit like riding a jet ski, and it's just so immediate you turn. Yeah. A little bit. I don't, I'm, I'm, yeah, I mean, I think I think your analogy of a go-kart is probably what feels closest to me. Yeah, the sensitivity of steering. Um, yeah, but it, it's it's great fun. Um, could you have an adventure on it? Oh, yeah. Could, I reckon easy. you could. Soft yeah. luggage on here. And the great thing about this is that it's really easy to adapt for disabled people. Mm. Um, they, they were telling us at MMPs how um, they can get a brake lever put up here uh, and actually, that you can ride it if you, you know, yeah. if, if you're disabled and things like that. So, and of course, quite versatile like that. You don't need a bike license for it, so anybody with a car license can jump on and ride it. I think you have a great adventure on it. I mean, you're not going to get the ability to scoot through traffic, handling the sort of thrill you get from twisty roads and stuff. I think it just it's kind of a thrill of its own. It's a different. It's still a thrill. It's just a different just type different. of thrill. Yeah. yeah. I think you have a great adventure on it. You should try starting it. You have had the sequence start it and explain to you, so now you start it. Go top. Okay. Not that I'm counting. Okay. So, obviously key ignition. Yep. Let it do that thing. Yep. Is it, do you have to do, do you have no, to do you the can't, handbrake you can't first? Questions, you just gotta do okay. it. It's not just a straight. <laughs> right. Right. Wrong. There was something <laughs> about the mode, wasn't there? That's from... It's your parking brake on, it's your parking brake Oh, parking brake first, okay. Release parking brake, okay, that's done. Yep. Now I can... Now? He's you did it, dude, you did it! So it was my turn to challenge Graham, and I wanted to see whether this bike could turn heads. So I got Graham to drive down the high street of a local town and see how many people had a look at his bike. You touched on the, uh, the practicality of a three wheeler. Yeah. Um, I'd like you to show us how easy it is to do a three point turn. Right. Well, do that, you, it does have do a reverse gear. It does have a reverse, yeah. Okay. That's one way to do a three-point turn. I'd like to show you how I do my feet.
apart from this being a little uncomfortable. <laughs> a little. Tom, <laughs> is that a lollipop in your pocket or are you just pleased to see Actually, me? To be fair, it's a lens. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel glad you think I'm that blessed, if I'm honest. <laughs> so yes, apart from this being a little bit awkward, uh, it certainly is quite comfy on the back. Yeah. Oh, I mean, the, the seat is amazing. It's kind of the first thing you feel when you get on it is, oh, mm, massage bum time. <laughs> Don't make that noise when you're sitting in, when you're sitting in between my legs. <laughs> But yeah, I, I, it's great fun. It is a lot of fun. I think, like we said earlier, you could definitely have a really, really good adventure on it. You're not going to take it off-road other than maybe a little bit of gravel. Well, it hasn't got the ground clearance for a start no, to do off-road. No, that much ground clearance. But it is great fun. Mm. Yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd tell you what, this would be the ideal thing to hire for a week on a holiday. Yeah, it'd be perfect. Yeah, you have a real thing. 16 grand? I'm not sure. I don't know, if I had the money, to have lots of toys, this would definitely be a toy that I'd have. Yes, but would it replace an adventure bike? No, 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 it wouldn't. No, no, no it wouldn't. But it might replace. I don't know. I mean, if I no, it wouldn't replace a bike. But at the same time, you know, if for instance I had some sort of injury and I I needed a bike, I wanted a bike. I'd buy this over a trike, and I'd buy this over a sidecar unit. Yeah, me too. Because it's yeah. more fun. Um, yeah. I like it. I like it too. A lot of fun. There we go. No, 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 no. No, wait, you presenter, can take... Presenter. No, we said home. that you would take the car and I could drive this back. No. No, 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 no it's my turn. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Now it's time for another first on Adventure Bike TV. It's the first time we've had somebody back for a second time on Under the Visor. We got Graham Field to come back and tell us all about what's been happening since he broke his back. Don't ride here. Ride here. Explore new horizons with Moto Freight, proud sponsors of Under the Visor. Uh, my name's Graham Field and I've been given the honour of being the first ever person to have an Under the Visor update. This is a, my second Under the Visor interview. Why am I worthy? Well, I've been a huge fan of Venture Bike TV since the early days. I've watched you grow, I've watched your hits and your viewers grow. I've shared your posts and uh, I think I deserve it. And here I am, deservedly taking my uh, recognition. I think it's been three years since we last spoke and a lot has changed. There's been two more books, there's been a few more rides and there's been some health issues and there's been a relocation. Uh, well, I, turns out I had a broken back. I had a broken back for a year and a half. I didn't know it. And um, when we did our wheelie school, I had a broken back. When I did my iron butt challenge, I had a broken back. And uh, this year, one of my goals for 2017 was to try and get rid of this pain. I had continuing contradicting diagnoses and I finally got a uh, MRI and the surgeon said, well, you've got discus hernia. Yeah, I know that. You've got 17 millimeter displacement. Yeah, I know that. You've got a slip disc. Yeah, I know that. And you've got fractures. Did you say I got fractures? yeah, your back is broken, and if you don't do something about it, soon you won't be able to walk. So he said, you need to consider an operation. I said, okay. He said, when will you know? I said, I know, we'll do the operation. And this was on the Friday. He said, well, um, he said, it's not urgent, we'll do it Wednesday. So I went in for tests on Wednesday. On Thursday, I had a seven hour operation and uh, got six screws and two rods in my back. I'm totally fixed, the sciatic pain is gone, the posture is good. There's no pain at all. I can do all the things I used to do without the pain and the complaining. 
Yeah, Eureka uh, book, which was the trip to Iraq and on to Azerbaijan, uh, came out. And also there's a new book called Different Natures, which are three different trips that all started in Colorado. One around Western States in 2001, another one up to Alaska in 2007, and a third one down to the southern tip of Mexico in 2012. Three different trips, sort of learning experiences, filling in the gaps and answering some questions that arose in the first two books. Um, and also those books have now just started to get published in the States. So In Search of Green Grass is now available in the US, Eureka is about to be, and we are now more sensibly spelling it with an E because I thought it was so clever, my play on words of spelling Eureka with a U because it was a U-turn, but in actual fact, if anybody put it in a Google search, they never found it, so we're now spelling it right. <laughs> I have, yes, now she's a little older. I'm uh, prepared to acknowledge her existence. I don't think my private life had anything to do with adventure motorcycle riding. And so Madeline's come over to, um, to England for the very first time. And um, I won't say I wasn't nervous about it, but it's going pretty well. And if she's not enjoying it, she's really faking it well. <laughs> <laughs> the gnashing teeth and criminal tongues conspire against the odds. But they haven't seen the best of us yet. If you love me, let me go. All right. <laughs> Absolutely. And a little death. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> I did. Um, when I, in 2013, when I went to Iraq, I drove, rode through Bulgaria and really liked it. And a couple of years ago, I was asked to go and do a presentation at uh, Horizons Mini Meet there. And I went back and it was just as good as I remembered. And so I ended up buying a house there. I now live in a small Bulgarian village. Uh, there's a motorcyclist bed and breakfast, I suppose you call it, called Motor Camp. And it attracts motorcyclists from all over the world. The wonderful thing about it, Bulgaria being where it is, no one there has started their trip. They've come up from Africa, down from the UK, across from the stands. And so you get such a diverse uh, bunch of riders, all of which are have got some stories to tell because they haven't just set off. So there's this wonderful, all through the summer, there's this constant mix of different people. So I've got this constant change in social life. I've got beautiful scenery, beautiful roads, lovely climate, and no regrets, two years. I'm struggling to learn Bulgarian, trying as hard as I can, and even dating my Bulgarian teacher, but it's still not quite coming that easily. <laughs> The, the uh, question of the weekend has been, when are you going to have another book? Everybody's waiting for a fourth book. I've got the material, I've got the title, I've got everything I need. I no longer live in Essex. When I lived in Essex, it was so easy to write, there was nothing else to do. Now I live in Bulgaria, I'm having so much fun, but I will, I will this winter sit down and hopefully by the spring of 2018, there will be some new material. <laughs> The, the problem with this contentment is that um, I'm not as driven to, uh, to ride, do journeys as I used to. I was always the one on the motorcycle with my pack panniers, leaving a home stay, waving off the people who had housed me and looking at this enviable look in their eyes as I went off to my next adventure. Now I'm the one who's doing the waving to the people who are leaving on their bikes. And to be honest, I'm quite content with that, turning around and thinking, right, what am I going to cook for dinner? It's a, it's a great existence. Saying that, there are always plans, but after what happened with the Eureka trip where it all went pear-shaped, I'm now a little bit superstitious about saying what I'm going to do in case it goes wrong. So yes, there's always plans and there will be another trip. Don't ride here. Ride here. Explore new horizons with Moto Freight. Proud sponsors of Under the Visor. Okay, right, well, end of the show. It has been a beautiful day, and uh, I'm gonna jump back on that Can-Am and go and have another spin. See you next month. Adventure Bike Shop, proud sponsors of Adventure Bike TV. 
rubbish adverts. Greater adventure.